robots are indeed already here. We have a good picture of what robots should be based on our own imaginations. Uh, we have robots that are both good and helpful, and we have robots that are a little scary, right? And that same thing exists in the real world. You're all involved in manufacturing. Manufacturing robots have existed for decades, helping us to build things like cars and airplanes. Right? We also have robots in our homes now, like the Roomba and some other robots uh, that can mow our lawn or, or clean our floors. And then we also have scary robots, like the Reaper. Right? And I want to be very careful about how I define a robot early on. So robots in general are sensing the world around them and perceiving that, making decisions based on what they see, and then acting based on those decisions. Right, so we have both autonomous robots, like the Roomba, that can run around and clean floors all day, and we have robots that are teleoperated, like the one that you just saw. Right? So there was a human in that loop making some decisions for that robot. So we have both autonomous and teleoperated robots, and both can do a lot of good for us, especially in the context of manufacturing. Right? And you're at the exponential manufacturing context, uh, conference, so hopefully I don't need to convince you that robotics are on this exponential trend. Uh, but one of the things that I want to point out is that we're at a point right now where I think that the robots of reality are starting to get a lot closer to the robots of our imagination. We don't have R2-D2 and BB-8 yet or, or Baymax, but we're getting a lot closer to that point. Right? And there's a lot of, just to give you some sense of the, the um, speed that this is happening at, Three or four years ago, DARPA started the DARPA Robotics Challenge, and this was in response to the Fukushima disaster. So traditionally, robots have worked really well in environments like manufacturing, where you have a very structured um, environment. You know exactly where everything is. You don't have to deal with a lack of structure. An accident like Fukushima resulted in a very unstructured environment, where the robot would ideally have to get through rubble, um, be able to get through doors, this sort of thing, right? And there could have been a lot of, um, a lot of property saved, a lot of difference made if a robot could have just gotten in there and turned a valve at the right time, right? But we didn't have that capability then. So this is an example of a program, and this is one of these challenge programs that DARPA started with a million dollar prize to see if you could have robots do a certain number of tasks, like climb through rubble, turn a valve, open a door, get in a Jeep, for example. Right? And these are some of the robots that participated in that challenge. That was 2013. Right? The robot that you see doing household chores there is the robot that came in second from a group in Florida. Right? But it doesn't really do the chores much better than my four-year-old does chores. Right? You see the video is very sped up. It's very slow. It does very simple tasks in general. Right? What you actually saw in the competition was stuff that was more like this. Right? So this was in 2015, right? and this was happening all the time. So it turned out a handful of robots did complete all of the challenges, but they were tricky challenges, and they did them very slowly. Right? So this is more like my one-year-old, basically, right there. So this was last year. So this is the same company that did a lot of the hardware for that challenge, Boston Dynamics, just down the street. Right? And this robot was really enabled to perform much better in these unstructured environments, in large part due to manufacturing. So the new choice of materials, they use as additive manufacturing. They were able to make the whole thing lighter weight, more easily controllable, faster, and that made it much more adaptable to very unstructured terrain. Right? And locomotion is one really challenging thing, but obviously there's a lot of lack of structure in manufacturing environments of all sorts, right? When it comes to manipulation as well as moving around in that environment. So there's a lot of things really leading to this pace of change in this area. So obviously computation and sensing, right? You already heard Neil talk about AI. About AI. That's a big part of it. Sensing the open source movement is probably an undersold aspect of it. The idea that people don't need to reinvent the wheels each time. I can go use a, a navigation algorithm that's already been developed, or I can use a particular perception strategy that somebody's already done, and I don't need to solve that problem over and over again. Another big part of it that I think is undersold is the use of manufacturing materials, like you saw in that Atlas robot from Boston Dynamics. So the new manufacturing techniques make things lighter weight, faster, more controllable, and generally are going to help the performance of your robot in these more less structured environments. And then finally, markets, right? 
Robots are traditionally the domain of manufacturing and defense. Right? Robots are now starting to become much more pervasive and ubiquitous in our lives. Right? They're starting to come into the home. You see drones all over the place. Right? The idea of delivery and that last mile challenge being solved by autonomous vehicles. There's a lot of things that are starting to really um, amplify the progress that's being made in robotics. And so all of these I see as leading to three pretty important things when it comes to manufacturing. One is the adaptability of these systems, being able to handle less structured environments, being able to handle a part that's not exactly in the pose that you want it to be or in the place that you want it to be. Right? Softer, so, uh, safer, and more social robots is another big aspect of this. Right? If I have robots that are safe to work around, I can now collaborate with that robot. I can have people working side by side with robots. And that's going to dramatically shift a lot of manufacturing paradigms when it comes to robotics. And then finally, robots that are more autonomous, that are able to do more on their own and handle these less structured environments on their own without people behind them. So if I want to give you some examples um, of trends that are going on in robotics. So I'm a back, my background is in academia, right? So I'm thinking kind of further out, 5, 10, 15 years out in general. But we want robots, for example, that can handle terrain that we don't know what's going on in that terrain. In fact, this robot was inspired by a cockroach. Um, this is from Dan Kodachek's lab at UPenn. And you can see it handling things that you know, the robot that you just saw was incredibly powerful and robust, but would fall off the stage. Right? And this robot would, would survive that fall. Right? It can do, even do a little robot parkour um, in the park there with those jumps. Right, this is another robot that if you have $10,000 to spend, you can actually go out and buy now. This is from Ghost Robotics. So the previous robot solved this problem of adaptability through the choice of materials and design of its legs. So it made very compliant legs. This robot uses particularly actuators to help it do things like climb a fence or even open a door and be able to go into your office, which I admit is a little freaky, right? So this gives you some sense of what those motors can do, right? If I'm talking about a robot in a manufacturing environment and I want it to do more, it's going to have to both create large impacts and absorb large impacts, right? This is what we are very good at with our muscles. And this is just down the road, Songbae Kim at MIT, who is developing this robot cheetah. It needs to be very powerful, very fast, but also be able to handle disturbances in its terrain. Right? So you could imagine the same kind of thing going into a robot arm that's very fast, very powerful, but can handle small disturbances, recognize them, and still be safe around people. So this is moving from locomotion to a more traditional manufacturing paradigm of being able to pick things up. Right? This is actually a bin picking example um, from Right Hand Robotics, also in Boston. Um, the project came out of Harvard, actually, and this is an earlier model of their, their technology. Right? But the basic idea of being able to manipulate, pick up, and even manipulate all sorts of different objects when it comes to a bag of Cheetos all the way to an apple, and it can even pick up a quarter. Right? So the idea of being able to handle a wide variety of objects just by designing your physical system, right, the robotic part of it, so that it can grasp all of these different objects and handle them all in this very interesting way. Right, but AI can come into this too. Right? As I mentioned, you already heard Neil talking about AI right, and the basic idea that I have a lot of data and I can learn from that data. Right? This is Google's arm farm. They have a big room full of robot arms. And so in this case, they're trying to learn good strategies of picking things up, even with a very simple pincher-type gripper. Right? And so they basically sit there and try to pick things up over and over again, trying different strategies and recording what's successful and what's not. And this came out just this week um, from the OpenAI group that involves Elon Musk and a bunch of other people in machine learning and AI and robotics. And what you're seeing in this video is really cool. It's a convergence of a lot of the technologies you're learning about here today, of virtual reality, AI, and robotics. And what's happening is a person in virtual reality is doing a block stacking task. Right? So they're putting the blue block on top of the red block, the green block on top of the white block. Just by doing this once, and they're doing it in virtual reality, 
the robot is able to imitate what that person is doing, and it's able to do that no matter how the blocks are oriented in the first place. So it's able to abstract, OK, I'm just trying to put the red block on top of the blue block. I'm not trying to copy the action completely. Um, so this is, I think, a really exciting development that involves all of these different technologies. And you can learn from experts just in virtual reality. They don't even need to be located next to the robot. I think it's a very, very exciting step forward in this area. So ultimately, what adaptable robots mean for us is that robots aren't going to be left behind on the side of the road anymore, or in this case, left behind in the big manufacturing plants. They're going to be in a lot more places that we haven't traditionally seen them, in a lot of different manufacturing contexts that we haven't traditionally seen them, in things like that are more complex in agriculture, in energy, um, in construction. Right? You saw the 3D printed um, concrete house earlier. Right? One of the big challenges there is actually how I would do wiring, how I would do plumbing. Right? And if I have more agile robots, I can actually do things with these flexible substances that I couldn't do before. So the second part I wanted to get into is how robots interact with humans. And I think this is one of the really exciting areas of robotics right now. Right? If we took it one of these traditional manufacturing environments, and this is the Tesla plant um, from Fremont, so it's a very new plant. Right? But it's still, all of these robots are caged off from people. There actually is one person in that photo. You can do a little Where's Waldo game with yourself. Right? But they do have a red t-shirt to hide themselves. But this is a really big challenge for manufacturing, is how do I enable robots to work with humans so that humans can do the things they do well and the robots can do the things they do well. Right? So this gives you one example of a robot. And you'll see this, I think, later on this week as well from Rethink Robotics. This is Baxter. They also have a one-armed robot named Sawyer now. But really what they're doing here is making these robots effectively softer. Right? They're able to interact with humans in a softer way. They basically have springs in their joints that make them much more compliant and safe around humans. And one of the cool benefits that you get that this man is demonstrating right now is if I can interact with the robot, if I can touch the robot, now I have all sorts of new things that I can do as far as programming the robot. So now it's a lot like my uh, four-year-old. I say, I'll tell her, go pick this up over here, move your arm over here, and put it down over there. And that's how I program the robot. I don't need to know inverse kinematics. I don't need to know complex programming language. I can just do it by demonstration. So another company that's doing the same thing is Universal Robots. And one of the cool things I like about this video is it shows you the robots working really closely with the people um, in this particular manufacturing context. They're doing medical devices here. right? But the robot is working side by side with that person. And it's able to do that because it's lighter weight and safer and effectively softer. Um, and so it's also lower cost, right? These things only cost $20,000, $30,000, right, for both the Universal Arms and Baxter and Sawyer, right? So now it enables robotic manufacturing at a lot of places that couldn't do it before. So I can go max out my credit card, buy a bunch of robots, right, and actually set up a little hardware startup in my garage, right? Garages are no longer going to be the domain of software startups. I can actually do small-scale manufacturing now at low cost. Right? And this really gets to one of the interesting points. Right? The robots were working side by side with the people there, but what if the robots can actually work with the person? Right? They can lift a heavy object together. They can manipulate a heavy object together. Right? And that's hard enough to do with just another person. And in this case, the robot needs to understand what you're doing, and you need to understand what the robot's doing. And this is one of the really interesting challenges going on with robotics right now. And ultimately, you can lower the cost even further by making everything soft. So this is a startup in San Francisco called Nubotics. Right? And this is fabric and air. Right? There's not even plastic. There's not even soft rubber or anything. This is fabric and air, really low cost. If I was talking $20,000 for the other robots, maybe this is 200. But what you see in this video is the real challenge of these really soft robots is they're very hard to control. Robots in manufacturing are great because they're very precise. They can do the same action repeatedly. But this robot cannot right now. It draws a smiley face like my, my four-year-old, basically. Right? It's terrible. So the missing piece of this, I think, is one of the really hot areas in the research world right now. And that's the idea of soft sensors. This is something that my own group works on. So we have basically these soft robotic skins 
that we can laminate on various robots and have the data that we need to ultimately control them in an effective manner, in a more precise manner. So even if they're low cost, if we have these kind of sensors built in, we can now do the control uh, to make them robust. And these are obviously good for all sorts of things beyond um, just picking things up and, and just in standard manufacturing. I can actually use these soft robotics to make things like exoskeletons. And the idea of augmenting people in a manufacturing context is already starting uh, to gain a lot of ground in industry. So Lowe's just announced that they actually have a person, people in exoskeletons at a store in Virginia to help carry heavy objects, for example. Right? And one of the problems with traditional robotics for these kind of tasks is they're big and clunky and metal and heavy. Right? But soft robotics solves a lot of those problems. And this is why this is such a particularly important area, I think, in robotics for manufacturing right now. But the robots of our imagination are more than just you know, able to touch us, able to interact with us physically. They're also able to interact with us socially. And I think that's particularly important in a manufacturing context, especially when you have humans working alongside robots. Like I said, the human needs to understand what the robot's doing, and the robot needs to understand what you're doing. And in this case, if the robot can understand social cues, right, that helps a great deal. And if the robot can display social cues, like Leonardo here from Cynthia Brazil's group, you can do a lot, you can understand a lot better what that robot is actually experiencing. So in this case, the, the robot was meeting Elmo for the first time and was very excited about it. Right? And we also have these robots in social contexts like telepresence, right? And I think there's a couple telepresence robots around here as well. And this is the NASA CIO during sequestration, actually. I used one of these during my maternity leave. But the big problem with these robots right now is the lack of ability to manipulate the world. I actually crashed it into one of my graduate students trying to get his attention when I just wanted to tap him on the shoulder. Right? And then they didn't put it back on the charging station, so I didn't get to drive it around anymore, which was very upsetting to me. So there's a lot of problems still with these telepresence robots, but they're gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, and the ability to interact with people uh, a continent away is a big part of that. So one of the big things that has happened in the last year that I think is particularly important for manufacturing and robotics is development of one of these big advanced manufacturing institutes in the US. And this one's called the ARM Institute. It's advanced robotic manufacturing. And the real focus is on collaborative robotics, right? robots being able to work with people and complement people. So not necessarily taking a person's job, but complementing a person's job to enhance productivity and to lower the cost of that job so that you can potentially uh, onshore some of the manufacturing that's been done in the past. So there's about an $80 million investment from the DOD in this, an extra $170 million from different partner groups. These are all the various universities and industry members involved. And the real focus of this institute is taking research from the lab and actually commercializing it and using it in industry. So it's solving that kind of valley of death problem between academia and industry. So I think that's going to be really exciting going forward. So finally, what do so soft and social robots mean um, in this context? These robots are going to interact with, and perhaps more importantly, collaborate with people in the future. And so I think this is a really important thing, a point, point to take away from this, is that these robots are going to be working with people and not necessarily instead of people. So finally, I mentioned autonomy as a big advancement in robotics. Obviously, lots of reasons to inspire autonomy in the autonomous vehicle market. And that shows up in manufacturing, too. Drones you see all over the place, right? You think about them in terms of that last mile delivery problem that Amazon's been working on, inspection, all sorts of interesting contexts that robotics can come into uh, when they can fly around. This happens to be a cool one that I like because these are robots building structures. Right? And it's a lot of small robots, and granted, they're polystyrene bricks. They're not particularly heavy. Right? But you can build some pretty impressive uh, structures with these simple robots. And if you have more robots, like uh, this is from Vijay Kumar's lab at Penn, you can actually build some pretty impressive structures. And the interesting thing, if you have more robots, right, one of the cool things that technolo recent technology has enabled is the ability for these robots to actually network and interact with the cloud. And we call this cloud robotics. So the big Amazon warehouse robots that came from Kiva, um, some of these 
most of the computation happens in the network, in the cloud. And so that's a really important advancement for robotics is that the robot itself does not need to be the smartest kid on the block. Right? A lot of those smarts can actually happen um, up in the cloud. And you can build more impressive structures and do more impressive things if you can coordinate in that fashion. Right, and finally, you have autonomy beyond drones that's relevant in this context, like warehouse robots. This is Fetch Robotics. Uh, you'll see the, the CEO, I think, of Locus Robotics later that's doing similar things of the idea of being able to handle a lot of the tasks that you would handle in, in warehouse scenarios. So be able to pick things up, um, be able to move them to the right place, and those sort of things. So finally, these autonomous robots really emphasize that these are going to do more on their own. This whole study of autonomy, robots are going to do a tremendous amount on their own without humans in the loop for the first time. They're going to be able to do that in less structured environments, because a lot of autonomy is being able to perceive your world and understand your world. And they're going to be able to do that without human intervention. So it's a pretty fascinating time to work in the area of robotics, as you just saw um, on stage with these kids. They're adaptable. They're going to be able to use new designs, new materials, new manufacturing techniques to have higher performance, lower cost, and work in more complex environments. They're softer and safer and more social, which is going to enable them to work both collaboratively with humans as well as just interact with humans and be next to humans. And then finally, autonomy is really allowing these robots to do more on their own in these less structured environments. And as you just saw, it's a pretty fascinating time to learn about robotics. I, most of you probably have kids, and the biggest question I always get asked is what I should buy for my kids, right? The Lego Mindstorms that the, the previous group mentioned, the first robotics group mentioned, is fantastic. All the way from age five to almost 40, right? It's a fantastic uh, a platform to play with. Uh, my my four-year-old has a dash and dot robots in the corner. Anki's Cosmo just came out that's particularly cute. Drones are fantastic uh, for kids to play with. It's a really amazing time uh, to work with these robots. So with that, I will thank you very much for your time. Thanks.